morning to now, you've made approximately 3,000 decisions. Some of which were extremely significant, others which were relatively less. Nevertheless, each one of those 3,000 decisions altered how your day is gone. And now you've ended up with this unique combination of choices. One out of the 6,000 possible ways you might have experienced today. It's these decisions made by individuals like you that have led to the inevitable crossing of paths of people, ideas, and industries. It's these decisions that, are, that have added up over time to form mountains from dust. And it is these decisions that have molded our world and altered our course in the labyrinth that is life. So recently I've been making a few decisions of my own on which subjects I want to study in Ivy University. And when I was having trouble doing so, I turned to various blogs and articles about decision making. And the way most people see it, making decisions is a clear concept. While we may not pay much attention to what occurs between the moments when we are presented to options and when we reach a conclusion, it's extremely significant in understanding what decisions really are. Researchers at the University of Massachusetts have broken down this daily process into six basic steps. You first identify that there is a decision to be made, after which you'll usually gather more information, whether it be from books, the internet, or other sources. Once you have this pool of information, you'll design other alternatives or find other ones. After that, you'll weigh your evidence and choose the option that's best for you. After you've taken action on this decision, you'll go back, reevaluate it, and even change it if need be. Now, from this perspective, the entire decision-making process occurred in your brain, in a special section called the frontal lobe, which is not only responsible for decision-making, but also for problem-solving and developing your personality. It seems quite simple and straightforward, and because of that, many of us accept that we're in complete control of our decisions, that they're made by us, for us. A few weeks ago, I came across a book by a behavioral economist by the name of Dan Airy, who is a professor at MIT and has devoted a significant amount of time in researching what, this, what decisions really are and whether we're in control of them. But before we get to some of the studies that he wrote about in his book, I'd like to show you a series of images. Most likely ones that you've seen before. I'll present a question with each one of these, and I want you to make a decision on your perception of the image. Which block is darker? If you think it's A, can you please raise your hand? And it's B. They're actually the same. Which line do you think is longer? If you think it's the one on the left, can you please raise your hand? And the one on the right? Shocker, you're wrong again. The last one. Which dot appears to be larger? If you think it's one, the one on the left, can you please raise your hand? And the one on the right? The same. So for each one of these images, you relied on the background to make a relative decision. You didn't know for a fact that they were that one was larger, one was smaller, but you used the background to help you. Um, for the blocks, you looked at the color of the other block and where the light appeared to be falling. For the lines, you looked at the bricks behind the lines and assumed that the bricks were of, the, of equal dimensions. And as for the dots, you looked at the dots surrounding it. In every single scenario, you made a relative decision, not a definite one. This concept of relativity isn't only seen in optical illusions, but also in other areas in which we make decisions. For instance, one of the studies conducted by Mr. Airely was originally an ad for subscriptions of The Economist. Readers were presented with three options. The web-only subscription for $59, the print-only for $125, and the print plus web for $125 as well. When asked which one they would choose, around 84% of MIT students chose option number three, the print and web for $125. 16% chose option number one, and 0% chose option number two. And it seems quite straightforward, right? I mean, getting the best value. But when we take out option number two, remember, this is the one that no one wanted. 0% of people chose this. More MIT students were uh, choosing the web-only option for $59, and significantly less the print and web for $125. They changed their decision. Similarly, in another study, um, the test subjects were presented with two options, an all-expense paid trip to Rome or an all-expense paid trip to Paris. And at first, 
The results were quite even, with around 50% choosing Paris and the other 50% Rome. But when we add a third option, the option of Rome without breakfast in the morning, the statistics changed drastically. Obviously, no one chose the option of Rome without breakfast, but Rome with breakfast became increasingly popular. In fact, even more popular than the option of the all-expense-paid trip to Paris. So, what does this tell us about our decisions? It reveals that we don't actually know what we want, but we make a decision based on what we perceive to be the default. In the case of the economy subscription, the default was the print. And in comparison, getting the print and web for the same price seemed like the better option to go with. In the case of the vacation case study, the default was the destination, Rome. And in comparison, getting breakfast in the morning seemed like the better option to go with. So what this actually means is that the real decision-making process looks a little bit more like this. You first are presented with two options, after which you'll identify which aspects of the choices are similar. This is known as the default. In the economy subscription, the default was a print. It was what was similar to option number two and three. And in the vacation case study, the default was a destination. It was similar to options number one and two. And then after that, you'll take those two choices, the ones that are similar, and then make a decision based from those two. So while our decisions seem to be irrational, they certainly seem to be predictable. If I told the person sitting next to you that he or she would have to pay me $20 to listen to my speech, how many of you would be willing to listen if I offered you 10? What if I told your neighbor that I would give them $50 to listen to my speech? Would you still be willing to listen if I gave you only 10? Just like that, in an instant, I've changed most of your decisions. Not because I've persuaded you to take one option or because I've highlighted the disadvantages of choosing another, but by simply changing what your first exposure was to the options available. And you use this to find similarities. So if our decisions are so easily swayed, what does this tell us about the decisions we've made in the past? How can we be so sure of the observations we've made in the real world? Remember, these are decisions. When we couldn't make, some, we couldn't make a decision as, about something as simple as color the first time around, as of now, behavioral economists and philosophers are hard at work in breaking down what reality really is, and how we as humans are limited in the sense that we, we're not exposed to as much as we think we know. But the main thing that I took away from this, and what I hope you'll take away today, is the realization that perhaps we're not as knowledgeable about the world as we think we are. But most importantly, I hope you walk away today with the inspiration to break the boundaries of what we already know. Thank you.